War Poet, this is White Rabbit. Come in over. White Rabbit, this is War Poet. Go ahead, over. I'm at Breach Point Alpha. Ready to breach. Kill power. Copy, stand by. Almost set. War Poet, we need to enter now. Almost there. Try disrupting their NTP servers to confuse their collectors. That should buy us some time. Hey, how about you do your job and I'll do mine? War Poet, I need to breach now. I'm getting an error message. Incorrect Gmail password. Why are you checking your email right now? All right, so I go to my Internet Explorer and I just... War Poet. Now. All right, it's saying to install updates and restart my computer. This is definitely an ID10T error. I don't. Abort. War Poet, we can't abort. I'm here at the breach point. And my computer just died. Abort. I'm out of here. I'm going to jail. Guys, reel me up. Still here. Let's go. All right, folks, welcome back. I've got an old longtime friend, Troy. What's happening? Troy is a professional hacker. He has a cybersecurity company, and that's what you do. You do hacking, but you don't get in trouble for it because you're one of the good guys, right? That's correct. Uh, we're called what we call pen testers or penetration testers. It's a $10 word for ethical hacking. We, we're a little pretentious in this industry. That's a weird way to say Cool, I like that. It's a funny word to apply to yourself. It's always derogatory, but in this case, that just kind of suits you, right? I agree. Very good. Cheers. Hey, thanks for uh, thanks. being back on. We are talking about pretty goofy and really scary subject, and that's the whole artificial intelligence and singularity stuff. Every movie, Terminator to... Uh, what are the? It's it's all of them. Pretty much it? everything. Yeah, and anything where we have you know machines taking over the world, and there's a. It's almost always an apocalyptic scenario too, and there's some truth to that, or some potentiality to that, if this is even possible. Uh, but one thing I do want to say is, preface the whole argument with this is a very complicated topic, right? And there's a lot of moving parts, and there's different dimensions, and and a lot of different questions to ask. I think personally the most important questions are can we and should we? Right. And when we start to think about all the different dimensions to this, there's a technical dimension, which I can kind of weigh in on uh, from a cybersecurity standpoint. There's an ethical dimension, there's a legal dimension, there's a spiritual dimension to this. Uh, very complex. Uh, we're certainly not going to get through all of that, but I do think that a lot of people, and this is something that's been in the news quite a bit, you hear. Uh, these tech entrepreneurs like Elon Musk talking about how they're scared of AI and how we need to not do this or prepare for it in certain ways. And their concerns are not entirely unfounded, but what is missing from the conversation is the discussion of the cybersecurity impacts of this. Because in a nutshell, what we're talking about is creating the ultimate hacker. Got it. I thought that was you. No. <laughs> Oh, well. I'll take that title. Well, there, there, <laughs> there that goes. Uh, what is the singularity? Mm. Uh, is, I've heard that word. Sure. We've talked about it before, but just for everybody out there, what is the singularity? This so, big, spooky <laughs> technological doomsday. So the singularity is the topic du jour at happy hour for cybersecurity professionals and technology nerds alike. Uh, this is what we like to entertain, what is possible and what could happen. The singularity is a, a notion that there is a moment in time where we will create a machine that is able to make itself smarter. Mm -hmm. And because it's a machine, it is not bound by the limitations of our slow minds or our slow bodies. It can improve itself again and again and again, faster and exponentially faster potentially, to a point where it will instantaneously become the most sophisticated intelligence possible, Got theoretically. It. Okay. Very good. All right. Well, depending on who you talk to, there's a number of factors in this about around when this might happen, right? And okay. this is a topic of debate. Uh, there's something called Moore's Law that gets thrown around a lot in this in this discussion. I don't think it's a relevant thing. Uh, Moore's Law is the idea that technology gets faster and faster exponentially every year, right? R really, what it is is it, it's it's a it's a, a postulation of how many transistors we can fit into a certain space. So it right. is limited to a certain extent. It's inductive reasoning. It because, is. Because we doubled the speed and half the size last year, we'll do it again ad infinitum. It's a logical fallacy, it, and eventually it, the buck's going to stop. Eventually, we'll figure out how to make a transistor out of an atom, 
and then we can't go any further. So Moore's law is a transistor thing. That's more of an electrical engineering thing. Okay. So I would encourage people to ignore that. But generally speaking, uh, the timeline when this can happen is estimated sometime between 2025 and 2045. Right now, the popular idea is 2045 is when we will achieve the, the singularity. Right, so a, a couple problems I have. The, the technical side, I've got to sub out to you and be like, I don't, yeah. I don't speak. I, I speak in normal language. I don't, <laughs> I don't see the world like the matrix and zeros yeah. and ones like you yeah, do, which yeah. is really cool, by the way. Uh, but there's a, the philosophical side where I'm just like, okay, I get that a computer could be extremely fast, but there's certain elements that I can't imagine a computer actually having. There's mm -hmm. some kind of life components that sure. make it a little bit more sober, meaning when you write a computer program, presumably, or you make a machine, it's always bound to the constraints of its, you know, how it's written, correct? Mm -hmm. So yeah. even if it's learning, that's that learning process is something that's pre-programmed and and what i can't imagine happening is the old mary shelley's problem mary right. shelley frankenstein it's kind of like all right i get all the parts there and then i zap it with electricity to bring it to life what is the essence of that life where does that come from because i, I recognize in, in a biological scale we're nowhere close to creating life we're nowhere we're not closer to creating the Frankenstein monster. And then all of a sudden there's this swell of optimism in the technological world of like, all right, now we're going to have a machine that is brilliant, artificial intelligence for, for that term, but to have self-awareness and to have will and desire and a philosophical stake and a worldview and decisions and thought. Creativity. You know, it's, it's kind of like and, all those yeah. essential life things that, that I have that no computer, no matter how fast its calculations have, what about will or desire? And I'm thinking like Age of Ultron right now, one of those technology mm -hmm. ultimately rises up, sees us as obsolete and moves to sure. eradicate us, which really shows us something about uh, the human condition where we're like, we know we're bad and we know that perfect goodness would want to eradicate us. See, that's there's the, a theological slant absolutely. there that's really in harmony with uh, anyway. It's very similar to trying to ascribe human intent or motives to uh, uh, to God, right? So if, right. You, if you think about it this way, we assume that a, a, a sophisticated intelligence like AI would destroy us because that's what we would do if we were that that thing, if we were the AI. Every instance of history, right. when the sophisticated culture finds the less sophisticated culture, the more sophisticated culture inevitably destroys the less one, right? That's a human condition. Right. If we're talking about an artificial intelligence, which you are correct, it is pre-programmed, pre-programmed in the sense that we are also pre-programmed by our genetics. Right. So there's, there's this sort of lack of human intervention in the learning of this, or we can modulate that to a certain extent. It's just like you would raise a child. If you raised a child on violent movies and things like that, you're gonna have a different adult than sure. if you taught them real values and real you know, uh, right. real philosophy. But whereas a human, a, a, a organic life form is going to differ always from a computer is where is the computer's force of will? Yeah. Where is its desire? In, yeah. in which case it's kind of like, it's still zeros and ones that it's, at its core, and it's it's still operating in accordance with its basic structure, it doesn't have a desire in there. It doesn't have a yeah. will in there. And so how do you move from non-life to life? How do you leave, move from something that's programmed to something that basically breaks off? And I think that uh, despite how fast our processors are getting and how much we can make something appear to have that humanish desire, will, mm -hmm. soul, for lack of a better, uh, term and I think actually soul is a great term. Yeah. How do we leap to that? I still think it's probably a swell of optimism akin to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. If we can put all the parts there, but there's nothing we can really do to zap life. We're no closer to something that was self-aware and having decisions like Ultron would mm -hmm. and saying, hey, where you had Ultron and what was the vision? Yeah, they both so. were yeah. philosoph <laughs> philosophizing robots. Yeah, yeah. yeah where yeah. of like, I think this. I'm like, ah, oh, where you went wrong is this. And they're making these philosophical conjectures. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. I think we're as far from that as Frankenstein's monster. I think Mary Shelley hit the nail on the head. And I think the message is loud and clear, and we should all pay attention, is that we are, in fact, playing with fire here. Right. And 
we don't even really understand what consciousness is, yet we are yeah. relentlessly pursuing the creation of, of synthetic consciousness. Yeah. That is, and we have no idea what the implications of that, consider even the legal ramifications. What if an AI robot accidentally kills another person? Who, who's to blame? Yeah. How do you punish a robot? Or it, or can you? Can you, you let put the it? batteries run down for a while? I, I guess it. it's it's there's there's like I said there there's a many and it's absolutely fascinating. That's why this yeah. is such a predominant fixture in science fiction today, yeah. is because it deals with so many aspects of technology that many people don't understand and aspects of humanity that we may never understand. Yeah. So we got to be careful when we're dealing with AI. But from a cybersecurity standpoint, it's absolutely terrifying to me. Yeah, and I, I could see how, all right, we just continued, the, the robot gets more and more brilliant, self-learning in that mm -hmm. way, but even that self-learning, it's in, it's learning and rewriting itself and better. I'm still saying, ah, we're, I, I think we're ultimately extremely far from consciousness where yeah. it comes in and says, but I don't like humans and I would like to eradicate them. I think it's more of like, there's some little tiny gesture in the algorithm that gets exponentially large and then it, inside of its programming, decides to make us obsolete because that's part of, and I think that's the whole doomsday mm -hmm. argument, but it's more akin, it's less like we have created a living thing that's out to get us, and more like we are playing with a nuclear bomb in yes. a technological realm, and ultimately it blows us up, not because it wanted to kill us, but because that was the glitch in the algorithm that over time exponentially replicated itself and ultimately it killed us all. And that's the Shelley yeah. thing as well. We are ultimately uh, going to bring about our own demise. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, we see that whether it's Cold War kind of stuff or it's just uh, our own spending ourselves into utter debt or sabotaging mm -hmm. our marriages or being bum fathers or we're destroying ourselves essentially. but. It, it kind of looks more like that, and it does look super scary. Uh, Singularity-wise, you said it would bring about the greatest hacker ever. Yes. And so, ultimately, I think the dog is still on a leash, even yeah. if it's the most brilliant it calculating is. dog. It is still on the leash. So, if we got the most brilliant hacker ever, what are the ramifications of that dog, that hacker, falling into the control of Big Brother or Big Tech, or what would that look like for cybersecurity? Well, let, let me explain just real briefly a bit of the black magic behind cybersecurity and I'm, why this I'm is scary. I'm okay. Guys, Troy has shown me all kinds of spooky, <laughs> scary stuff of like, can we say the deep web stuff? Dark and web. The dark yeah, web yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. And it was like with his cautionary tales. We've done other videos before. Make sure you check those out. Really interesting stuff, but he showed it to me and he's like, promise me you will never go here you never touch anything. And he was like really serious. I'm like, hey, Troy, bro, it's me. It's like, no, 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 you don't understand. Don't touch anything. Don't look at anything. <laughs> and then we went, and then you wiped your computer, yep. rebuilt it all. Yep. Black magic. Black magic. <laughs> Black magic. So in the cybersecurity world, we have these things called vulnerabilities. These are known weaknesses in technology. And, and there are famous vulnerabilities and they, they get published and shared around. We even have bounty programs. Many, many software companies have bounty programs where they will pay hackers to find these vulnerabilities and tell them about it so they can fix them so that a malicious hacker doesn't exploit those and cause some sort of damage or harm. The worst offenders in the vulnerability world are what we call zero-day vulnerabilities. And a zero-day vulnerability is one that is discovered but nobody else knows about it. And some of these zero days can go unknown for years. So a hacker that finds a zero day, and that's basically what we do, uh, they'll sit on that, they'll either sell it to other hackers, uh, they can use it to their own whatever purposes they want. Uh, sometimes they even sell them to the government. In fact, that's a big component of what security research is, is finding these vulnerabilities. And that's entire teams of people like that at, at three letter agencies like the NSA that find those, you know, you had Clint Emerson on, on, your, uh, on your show recently and he kind of alluded to the capabilities of the NSA. That's what he's talking about are those types of vulnerabilities and techniques uh, that we can use to, to basically do whatever we want. And these vulnerabilities can range from, I can reach out across the internet and take complete control of your phone without you knowing about it 
and I can do whatever I want. It is a machine, and if I have enough access to that machine, I can control every aspect of that machine. And that's how we have to think about technology. So when we use our technology to help us, it is a double-edged knife. It's, it kind of cuts both ways. It helps and hurts us in a sense because imagine a, you know, a medical device like an insulin pump that now has Bluetooth. Well, that's now an access point for me to be able to attack that device. And if I have a zero day for that, I can make that insulin pump do whatever I want. Whatever motor spins in that, I can, yeah. I can affect that. So with the onset of the greatest hacker ever, an mm -hmm. AI computer that could crack any code, what would that mean for Perfect online banking? Well, or first off, the, when, when, if we gave birth to AI, right? Yeah. And people talk about it like giving birth, like we're creating life. But if we were to create AI, this is a machine that is self-aware and is not limited by human biological constraints. So normally when a security researcher looks through the code to find these zero days, it takes a long time or a very specialized person, someone with a, a gift or a talent or someone who just focuses on that all day. And that's what they do. They go through you know, technology and they find these things and it takes a while. A machine could find them all instantly. Yeah. And anything that we create, we would never be able to outsmart such, a, such an intelligence. It would immediately be, all of our technology would become essentially subservient to the AI. The AI owns our tech at that yeah. point, and we no longer control our technology. How much of our life is, is ruled by tech? All of it. All of it, right. So yeah. what does that make us in that context? Um, yeah, now you're, are we the puppet master or are we dangling on strings? Exactly. And that is a spooky thought. One thing that is a saving grace is the robot doesn't care. Doesn't yeah. care, there's no will, meaning it could maliciously maneuver us into a checkmate of some kind to have us bend our, its, our will to its will, but it has no will. Mm -hmm. It is, it doesn't care. And so ultimately, no matter how smart it gets, it, I mean, self-aware and to have that soulish element of there's no, we can't wake up the monster. And it may uh, not even need to have will. That's the other thing is it may just be interested in self-preservation. But why would it even have the instinct of self-preservation? Depends on now how we train it. instinct of like there is yeah. no instinct there. It's just... Well, you're operating according to initial programming. It well, it depends on how we train that AI. But the desire to self-perpetuate, or even herd mentality, or moral impetus, <laughs> or will, or desire—all of those are, you know, like life-type thing. They're mm -hmm. soulish things. We can't yeah. we can't replicate those any. And so, I don't know. I, I think there's a, a little bit of a swell of optimism where we think ultimately clever or I mean it, uh, amazing yeah. calculator yeah. will all of a sudden become a human and I just think it's a little optimistic and what do I know but it is a philosophical question and so too. it's just hard yeah. for me to imagine because mm -hmm. I'm like how do you make that jump I haven't seen anything like that. if we're we even close to being able to do that we would have uh, solved the problem of death no one would die anymore yeah. we're not able to we're, you know my, um, there are some there are some people who and and these these people kind of live in what they call the transhumanist crowd. They're a little bit crazy. They're, they're sort of, they want to be cyborgs kind of thing and plug into AI and augment their thinking that, watching a lot of science fiction films, obviously. Oh, hey, I would love some <laughs> Matrix learning right there. But they, oh just... yeah, but, but they're, they're, we kind of have that, by the way, we'll get to that. But the, the, uh, the I... transhuman crowd, the, they have a perception that if we did create artificial intelligence, that it, it could be benevolent and could enhance our lives. So there's, there are some people that are pushing for it. There are others that are pushing against it. No one knows whether we should or shouldn't, or even if we really can. Right. That's the thing. But even benevolence. That, even benevolence. That's a, it will have will and desire to do the right thing. And How like, do we know that? How do, yeah. how do we know if it will even have will? I'm not, I'm not buying it. Uh, yeah. I'm not buying, but it was interesting. We were having some good conversations yesterday where Troy was asking me some really pointed questions regarding, well, what is life? What constitutes you? 
as a matter of fact? What if we were able to just take your brain and hook it all to com machines, would you still be you? What is the part of you that makes you you? What do you think? What do you think by that? Well, I remember how I answered, this but is, I, I, did, I don't think you answered yeah, because we were preparing for the videos and what, what I, do you think? I think that people are two different things or different things. We are biological machines in one sense and we are spiritual beings in another, right? Okay. And I think strictly from the biological machine, the, the argument here is sort of the cyborg argument is if you say you're an amputee and you have an artificial limb, are you still you? Of course you are. You just have, you have a medical device. Right. Well, what if we replace your entire body except for your brain? Are yeah. you still you? This is a, this was a, a very famous TV show in the 90s uh, called um, Ghost in the Shell. Oh, I thought you were going to say RoboCop. No, well, RoboCop yeah. too. Yeah, RoboCop. Oh, that might be the OG one. Every day, yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are you still you? And, and then the question is, well, okay, if we can replicate human tissue perfectly, mm -hmm. could we replicate the exact order of your neurons, the density of the myelin in them, exactly replicate all the circuitry in your brain, everything that we use to think and do? Theoretically, that would be you, a conscious, synthetic you, consciousness. Theoretically. Okay. Yeah, highly theoretically, because even though we can actually construct all the, right when someone dies, all that matter is there. It's yes. there of like, they died 30 seconds ago, all the stuff that they need is there, presumably. Mm -hmm. Let's say they had a problem with their heart or something, you fixed it, and then they're still there, you know, cold dead on the table 10 minutes later. How do you reanimate it? Of kind of like, we, we, we're at another loss, we have no idea how to, all right, we've got all the stuff now, live and we're Dr. Frankenstein cackling on oh, a roof. Yeah. And then to have yeah. will and desire and the personality, there's something else that's missing. And I think you said it best of we're a machine slash something else. And I think uh, 20th century philosopher, C.S. Lewis, man, I love, I've read 27 of his books, love C.S. Lewis, amazing. He, had, he was being interviewed about something where it's like um, somebody had said something to the effect of, uh, well, I have a soul. He's like, no, you don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. You are a soul. That's who you are. And that's a highly theological statement yeah. right there. Yeah. It's a highly philosophical statement. And right, anyway, sorry, we're <laughs> getting way on tangents, but philosophy is cool and important, and this is good theology. And it's too. very relevant to this topic. Yeah. And it's something that we don't often introduce into technology. Yeah. Is what ethics, for example. Uh, we have our, me our modern medicine, in most of science, anything that deals with the human condition has an ethical and philosophical component and they, it's taken very seriously. Doctors take their moral obligations very seriously, yeah. but we don't take that same care in technology. Mm. And I find that a little bit scary. There's been some instances where like the self-driving cars mm -hmm. have resulted in human life being taken. Yep. And, and so this is an example. That's of a great example. This AI. is the infancy of that technology coming into fruition. And every problem that, that we have foreseen is starting to emerge. Down to, the, we, we mentioned the legal question. If a self-driving car crashes into another car and kills the other, the other motorist, is it the car's owner's fault? Is it the car's fault? Is it the car company's fault? We have no concept of synthetic life. Yeah. or synthetic consciousness and we have our entire society is built on the idea that we are the top of the intelligence ladder because we are because we are yeah. and if there is something that potentially threatens that like artificial intelligence it completely upends more of our society than most people understand <clears throat> a lot of folks when they think about ai it's sort of like the will smith movie where it's just, you know, you've got a housekeeper yeah, or iRobot. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Where you have a, you know, a robotic housekeeper and that sort of, realistically, what it's going to be is your toaster is conscious and your, I know it sounds silly, but we have, it does. We have appliances that are more sophisticated than some of the equipment on the International Space Station. Right. So let's, let's be honest here is that at some point, if our technology can make a decision for us, right we better really trust that technology and we better really understand what it's what it can do what it's capable of doing because it's not it's not entirely outside of the realm of possibility for that dog to break its own leash 
If we accept yeah. that we can create something that can teach itself, it might teach itself something that we don't want it to know. Interesting stuff, guys. Anyway, we're trying to figure it out. We don't, <laughs> uh, but uh, really cool to have your expertise yeah. weigh in on all this stuff. And thanks for yeah, thanks. Helping, helping all these guys out. We're gonna do a little bit more with Troy in the future, so look out for future videos where he's gonna help us with uh, online and then and, and, anonymity. And, 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 that word. Uh, nailed it. <laughs> First try. <laughs> we'll do that and uh, some other stuff as well. Troy, thanks so much for coming out, man. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, cool. All right, see you guys.